Thank you very much, and it's an honor to be here with the Atlantic Media. Uh, David Bradley, who on a handshake formed a partnership with us 14 years ago for ideas festivals like this, and also Scott Stossel and, of course, Jeff Goldberg, who very kindly was, uh, did a cover story in this coming issue of The Atlantic, the great ideas magazine of America uh, that involves the Mona Lisa. And uh, I was just down the street. I urge you to go there this afternoon when you leave here, or at some point, at the National Gallery. It's only four blocks away. And there you'll see the woman behind me, Ginevra da Vinci, which is the only Leonardo painting that's not in Europe, the only one in America or any place else like that. And it was done when he was very young. It's an absolutely haunting and beautiful painting, but it's clearly the work of a young artist. After he did Ginevra da Benci as a young man in Florence, he got a little sick of uh, being a painter. He wanted to be an engineer, an architect. He writes a job-seeking letter to the Duke of Milan, and he talks about all the engineering he can do, all the science, all the anatomy and the flight of birds and the diversion of rivers and how rivers move. And only at the end did he say, I can also paint. So uh, the Duke of Milan hires him, eventually he has him paint the Last Supper, but Leonardo spends an enormous amount of his energy being curious about everything there is to know about everything that could be known, including how we fit into the cosmos. A lot of Leon people have written about Leonardo, including the great art historians of the past century who've written about him, say that his time spent doing science, anatomy, mathematics, geology, the course of rivers, were wasted. He should have spent more time finishing paintings because uh, it was sort of a diversion from his true talent, which is being a painter. But I want to talk about the science, the technology, the anatomy, the math, everything about the smile of the Mona Lisa. And I want to show why I think that Leonardo made no distinction between art and science. For him, it was all just having a fingertip feel for the beauty and the patterns of nature. And the way to do that is to look at Ginevra da Benci, go down to the thing, and then eventually look at the Mona Lisa. Because from the work of a young artist, that's very good, to the greatest and most creative painting in the history of mankind, which is the Mona Lisa, you'll see why it was so important for him to love everything, all forms of knowledge. Uh, he does his anatomy, as you can see in his slides, these are notebook pages. It's so wonderful that he left more than 7,000 pages of notebooks. That this one's at Windsor Castle, some are at Bill Gates' home near Seattle, others are in Florence, Milan, Venice, and papers of very, very good technology. In fact, if you look at my book, we use, you know, Simon Schuster uses really fine, good paper to have the color reproductions. It's actually a technology that lasts 500 years, unlike our tweets and Facebook posts. So we can go back and look day by day as Leonardo is doing things, including in this uh, anatomy drawing, dissecting a human being and figuring out every muscle and every nerve in the face. There are many of these drawings. This is just one of them. He's taking notes and figuring out which muscles hit the lips. Do they come from the brain? Do they come from the spinal cord? Which nerves control them? And then he decides to focus his anatomy around 1503 when he's meeting the wife of a cloth merchant, a wife named Lisa, and decides he wants to paint her portrait. And there he is dissecting the lips the smile, and knowing exactly how a smile or a movement of lips happens. For example, there's something very obvious, so obvious that none of us would have noticed it, but Leonardo did, which is that the muscle that moves the lips is, uh, if you want to purse both your lips, it's actually the bottom lip that is the muscle that ties it together, which means you can move your bottom lip all alone, and you can move both lips, but you can't move your top lip all alone. These are just the many things written on this page that he discovered about the human lips, how they work, 
and how a smile forms. Now, the reason I show this is if you look at the very top of this page of his notebooks, very faint, you're going to have to squint, there's something very cool at the very top center. After all these anatomy drawings, he's drawing a smile, a human smile. And you start seeing him do that over and over again until he gets to the smile of the Mona Lisa. Now, different drawings he does in that period, he's playing with ways to show the movement of the face and how it reflects inner emotion, something other artists hadn't done before. And always there's the mysterious smile with the tiny little details of the corners of the lip being anatomically perfect, but also a bit ambiguous. Is the person smiling or not? Somewhat elusive, somewhat unknown. My favorite Leonardo non-famous painting is Lady with an Ermine. She's one of Ludovico, the Duke of Milan's mistresses, and you see emotions and a drama, a narrative happening here. Because clearly, somebody has suddenly walked in, and both the ermine and the lady have turned, and they each have a slight wariness, a slight emotion. You can feel Ludovico coming to the door, and they're both looking that way. And once again, the mouth, perfectly in its movement, gives you a dramatic narrative. It all culminates in, I think, the greatest painting by far ever done. The Mona Lisa shows the connection of Leonardo's deep, deep care about how we connect to our universe. Just like Ginevra da Benci, if you remember the slide, there's a river coming from the eons in the background and almost connecting with the roads created by man and then the veins of the subject. It's called, as he did with Vitruvian man, sort of the macrocosm, microcosm. Our body is a microcosm of the cosmos at large. All of that's in there. But what particularly is interesting is the science of the smile. Not only has he, in his anatomy, dissected every muscle, every nerve, knowing how the smile works, but he's also dissected the human eye. He had to do it with his very inventive way. You have to put it in an egg yolk so it doesn't mess up when you're cutting it. But he realizes that the retina of the human eye, that the direct center of it has cones, the fovea, that see details, tiny detailed lines, if you go right into the center of the retina. On the sides of the retina, it sees shadows, and it sees colors better. So if you look at the Mona Lisa smile, there's something amazing about it. If you look very closely at the corner of her lips, they aren't actually moving upward. There's a tiny, tiny downward details in the lips. He's been trying this ever since he had done Ginevra da Benci. Now, that means that if you stare right at the Mona Lisa, if you stare right at her smile, it doesn't look like it really is a smile. It's kind of elusive. It sometimes doesn't feel like it's there. But as your eye wanders, just looking to her cheek, or maybe her cheekbone, or her nose, your eye wanders just a little, the light from the corner of the lips is coming into a different part of the retina. And it's the shadows and the colors that are more prominent. And as you can tell, he has the shadows and the colors turning upward. So as your eye wanders across her face, the smile flickers on and off. It's an elusive smile that reacts to us as if she is reacting to us and we are reacting to her. It's like the beginning of virtual reality. It's an interactive, scientific, and technical thing. So whenever I hear people tell me or ask me, wasn't he wasting his time with all that anatomy? The math, the way the eye works, how the golden proportion works, how the muscles and nerves work, we didn't need that. Wasn't that just a waste of time? I tell them to go see Ginevra da Benci and then to go see the Mona Lisa. And I say, the Mona Lisa will give you the answer to that question with her smile. Thank you all very much.